Good morning. Welcome everyone to today's BetaShares webinar. My name is Cameron Gleeson. I am Senior Investment Specialist at BetaShares. And I'm joined today by Luke Sheether from our Portfolio Management Team. Today we will be discussing a style of investing known as quality investing. Quality investing is an investment style or investment factor that I personally find intuitively appealing. And look, judging by the numbers of people who have registered for the webinar today, it certainly looks like many other people feel similarly. I hope that you find the information that we discussed today relevant and actionable. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. All information in this presentation is general in nature and doesn't constitute personal financial advice. Uh, a recording of this session and the slides will be sent to you, I believe, later this afternoon. So you can review that disclaimer in full uh, and, and obviously all the material presented here today. We intend to leave lots of room at the end for questions. Um, so this should be a 45 minute presentation. Hopefully that includes all the questions. Um, but please use that toggle that you see there on screen in the, um, the widget, the icon. Um, type in your questions at any stage during the presentation and we'll endeavour to get through as many as we can. If not, ideally, um, we'll also have someone from our, our broader team send out responses post, uh, post that webinar today. Briefly on BetaShares, we have the widest range of ETFs available on the ASX. More and more Australians are looking to use ETFs to build their wealth and you know, an increasing proportion of them are choosing BetaShares ETFs. Uh, we've consistently ranked number two for fund inflows over the last three or four years now um, of um, ASX listed ETF providers. BetaShares is an Australian founded business. Uh, the Product Development Committee and all our portfolio managers are based here in Australia. So we're absolutely focused on providing investment solutions with the Australian investor in mind. Today we're going to talk about several of our ETFs that pursue a quality investment style and Luke's here to introduce our recently launched BetaShares Australian Quality ETF, ticket code is AQLT. This is just another example of that focus on building investment solutions that address some of the unique challenges in Australia's capital markets, the nuances of, of, of Australia and this is obviously something where we're really keen to show that we, we address Australian investor needs. Now, as I said at the top, my name's Cameron Gleeson. I sit across our distribution team. I assist clients of all shapes, shapes and sizes with portfolio allocation um, and, and looking across asset classes, helping to understand underlying return drivers and interactions. I work closely with the portfolio management team and I also work across new product development. I've been at BetaShares now for just over two years, but have over 20 years experience in financial markets and asset management. Luke Sheetha joins me, he's uh, handsome photos here on the right. He works in the portfolio management team. He manages a number of our Australian equity ETFs, including the BetaShares Australian Quality ETF. Luke originally started with BetaShares back in 2016 and has 11 years experience in financial services. So today's agenda. We'll try to address the key question, how do we define a quality company? And then we'll talk about um, a port, how does a portfolio of quality companies behave as an investment and you know, with particular reference to the context of global equities and our BetaShares Global Quality Leaders ETF, QLTY. Luke will introduce the BetaShares Australian Quality ETF, AQLT. And we'll finish by talking about how these funds might be used by Australian investors in the context of their own portfolio construction. And then we'll allow some time for questions and hopefully get through as many as we can. So what is quality? Intuitively, holding a portfolio of high quality companies sounds like a sensible way to invest over the long term, doesn't it? And quality is not a new idea. Uh, active managers have talked about investing in quality for decades. And before them, Charlie Munger uh, and even Benjamin Graham uh, discussed the benefits of investing in, in what today we would actually refer to as quality companies. So this goes back over 70 years, really. There's actually also been a lot of academic research that's shown that quality is one of the best performing and most resilient investment factors. While investing in quality companies seems somewhat intuitive, there's actually no universally accepted definition of how quality should be measured. Quality investors have a range of different criteria or metrics they use, but 
you know, I, I can, th you know, I could generally group them into these three categories as to what is required of a quality company. Firstly, it must have high profitability, be very capital efficient. Secondly, low financial leverage. And finally, it must have a high likelihood that its earnings are able to be you know, stably generated into the future with a low degree of variability. Now, while the metrics that various investors use to select quality companies may differ, the end objective that they're all seeking is generally the same. They want to construct a portfolio of stable, profitable companies that are expected to perform over the long term and through the market cycle. These, these are the characteristics that they're looking for. But you know, how do we assess the profitability of a company? Profitability is measured by the financial ratio return on equity. Return on equity or ROE can be calculated from a company's financial statements. The three inputs are shown here on screen. Net profit margin. What premium can a company command for its product? Secondly, revenue divided by company assets. How well does a company use its assets to generate sales? And finally, because we're specifically interested in shareholder returns or shareholder outcomes, how effectively does that company use debt to maximize the outcomes or share of wealth creation that goes towards the shareholders? But then the question becomes, look, you know, just because a company has a high ROE, does that actually mean that, you know, it's the stock price will make Will it be a good investment? What happens to the stock price of these companies? Look, that does depend on one critical factor. Um, I'll invite Luke into the conversation now just to, to talk about this chart. Yeah, thanks, Cam, and good morning, everybody. Um, so th this slide is highlighting uh, the outperformance of companies that have managed to maintain a high return on equity over, the, over a period of three years. So both the orange line and the blue line here represent a group of companies who were once ranked in the top third for most profitable companies globally. However, the companies represented by the orange line were able to maintain their high level of profitability, while the companies represented by the blue line saw their profitability diminish over the following two years. So this chart demonstrates the importance of identifying companies that are not only have achieved high profits and high earnings, but companies who are able to achieve sustainable and stable earnings over time and through various market conditions. And this is why earning stability is a key metric used across all our quality funds here at BetaShares. Thank you, Luke. So now that we know what we are looking for at an individual company level, we'll introduce the BetaShares Global Quality Leaders ETF, QLTY, and we'll talk about how quality typically performs as an investment. Historically, quality has typically delivered outperformance versus broad market benchmarks. In the chart, we show the broad market MISCI World Index in light grey at the bottom of that chart that you can see there. MISCI's own quality index, which is actually beating the broad market benchmark, is shown in grey. So that's MISCI's quality index in, in grey there. Then above that, in orange, is the ISTOX Global Quality Leaders Index. Um, and that clearly outperforms both grey lines uh, since common inception going back to uh, around about 2001. Now, I, I do want to point out that both of these quality ind indices have in fact underperformed the broad market index over the last three months in particular, over the very short term. And we'll come back to that point later in the discussion. But you know, the key point for me really is looking at that long-term outcome how does quality perform over the market cycle? What's interesting is that studies have found that as you increase the investment time horizon over which you judge the performance of quality, say for example, looking at one year periods to three year periods to five year periods, the probability of outperformance by quality increases and the average outperformance increases or compounds over time. So this means that quality has the potential to be very suitable to be held as a long-term core, long core allocation across the market cycle. It's a very attractive characteristic for core allocations. B 
BetaShares Global Quality Leaders was launched in 2018 and it tracks that iStocks Global Quality Leaders Index that we showed on the previous slide. In tracking that index, the fund holds 150 of the highest quality global companies. Now, it used to be the case that if you wanted to get exposure to global quality companies, you had to invest with a high cost active manager. And those guys, you know, typically charge between one to up to 1.3% in terms of management fees, often also with a performance fee of up to 20%. However, you can now access QLTY at a fraction of that cost. It's 35 basis points is the total management cost, including all expenses. This is the cheapest global quality ETF available on the ASX. And you know, what's interesting is that when we look at the approaches used by active managers in this quality space, they often use a lot of the same metrics that are used by a rules-based or index approach such as QLTY. They use those metrics to filter the universe, to identify the, the entirety of the universe of quality companies. They'll then often overlay fundamental research to try to pick winners within that universe of quality companies. And what we've found is that second step of you know, fundamental research and stock selection doesn't necessarily add our performance. And in fact, when you overlay the higher cost load, often QLTY outperforms active peers that pursue a quality style. So we see quality as offering a portfolio with often you know, better diversification and better after fee performance than those active peers. I wanted to take you through a summary of the iStox Global Quality Leaders Index. And look, it is detailed. You can find a link to the full methodology document on our QLTY fund page. Um, but we start, the index starts with the largest 100, 1,800 stocks from global developed markets. For each of these stocks, the four quality metrics calculated that you see there, profitability, leverage, cash flow generation, and earning stability. Now, profitability we know is important. Return on equity is important. But Stocks and the team behind this index technology identified that leverage, cash flow generation and earning stability, the other three, were critical for ensuring that a company with high profitability today had a high chance of maintaining that high profitability into the future. Stocks then exclude the laggards on each of the individual metrics. They then create a composite quality score of all remaining stocks after those laggards are excluded. So that's all remaining global stocks. They rank the stocks based on that composite quality score. And only the best 150 stocks are included in the final portfolio. There's a 2% stock cap on any individual stock on each rebalance date. So excellent in terms of diversification, very low level of stock specific risk. It's a pure exposure to quality as a factor. To understand why quality delivers, you sort of have to look under the hood. And this chart here shows the return on equity of QLTY's index in orange versus the return on equity of MISCI World Index, the broad market in gray. And we see that over time, over the GFC, over COVID. The ROE you know, of, of QLTY's index clearly you know, very elevated versus uh, the broad market and very also very stable, sitting between, th rough, between 30 and 25% over this entire time period with far shallower drawdowns during COVID and during the GFC, for example. So this is a sort of characteristic you want to maintain in terms of holding quality stocks is that very high stable ROE over time. I'll invite Luke in again, just to talk a little bit about, about leverage and drawdowns. Luke? Yeah, thanks, Cam. Uh, so leverage, as you explained uh, in an earlier slide, Cam, uh, can be utilized by companies to bolster their return on equity. However, during periods of rising rates uh, or periods of severe market dislocation, like we saw during the COVID crash, high levels of leverage can become more burdensome and problematic for companies. And this is another reason why quality companies are able to maintain their success and high profitability over time. And this chart certainly illustrates uh, that the companies held within the QLTY index carry significantly less debt within their capital structure compared to other companies in the broader market. And we've touched upon it already, but perhaps one of the biggest draw cards 
um, to a quality factor exposure is its ability to better withstand turbulent times or market drawdowns. This chart displays a drawdown profile of both QLTY's index and MISCI World going back to 2002. A drawdown for those not familiar with the concept is defined as any fall from a previous peak. And we can see QLTY has certainly displayed defensive characteristics during many of the major market declines over the last 20 years, particularly during the GFC. We can also see that the maximum or largest drawdown recorded for the QLTY index over the last 20 years is 23.2%, compared to Misky World's max drawdown of 42.2%, which is quite a significant and uh, material difference. Thanks, Luke. And you know, to think about how quality you know behaves during a uh, during a drawdown, it's sort of you know, important to sort of think about the nature of markets, right? And the behaviour actually makes sense in a liquidity crisis like COVID, like the GFC. In the very ages, we tend to see that everything sells off at once in the equity market in the, those very early days. But then we tend to see that investors become a little bit more selective. They start selling down companies that are highly sensitive to overall economic conditions. And there is what's known as a flight to quality. Companies that have a lower level of, of debt or leverage also appeal. And companies that are able to preserve their earnings, their profit margins through downturns are also seen as, as more attractive. Um, and so this is, these are the characteristics we see, which mean that generally quality has shallower or, or smaller drawdowns. We also see that the quality companies tend to recover faster um, in that drawdown period, as we've seen on that previous chart. So quality is often referred to as an investment factor. Um, and you know there are as also obviously other well-known investment factors, one of which is value. Value is essentially a portfolio of companies which are considered inverted commas cheap. <coughs> now what we tend to see in equity markets is that different investment factors will perform better at different stages of the market cycle. S&P uh, did a study of factors in the Australian market, and I show uh, a graphic from, from this study in this slide, and they break the market cycle up into three phases. The bear market phase, which is shown in sort of yellow or cream on the chart, and that's, that includes like the GFC, then there's the early recovery phase, which they show in grey. And that, that comes subsequent to that, that obviously that bear market or that giant sell-off. And then we see that late, later bull market stage, which is shown graphically in blue. Now, unsurprisingly, S&P found that quality performs best in bear markets for the factors that we, we talked about before. But then once we enter that recovery bounce, we think about what's going on in the economy. Typically, inflation starts to pick up. and in in fixed income markets, yield curves start to steepen. Investors start to shift out of high quality stocks into what we describe as low quality stocks. The opposite of quality is typically value. Those stocks that are highly sensitive to economic conditions and that were pounded in the bear market now become really cheap and people want that sensitivity to economic conditions as the economy is improving in that early stage recovery. And I would suggest that arguably this is the exact environment that we've seen at the start of 2022. And it makes sense that globally, value has outperformed over the very short term as a factor versus quality. And quality is in fact lagged, particularly in January of 2022. What's interesting though, is, is really what comes next, that late bull market. Typically at that part of the cycle, we see that reserve banks, central banks start reacting from as, you know, reacting to, to the inflation and they start to raise cash rates and that beats down inflation, it dampens economic growth. And again, quality companies that can preserve their profit margins, that have pricing power, often do better. And that's what often why we see and why S&P have obviously found that quality uh, performs strongly in that later part of the cycle. So, you know, in summary, that they've found that quality performs best in bull and bear markets. Cyclical factors like value or small caps perform better in that recovery period. But there's a few implications here. Firstly, quality and value are somewhat you know, diametrically opposed. And because of that, they offer diversification benefits and can be blended together, which Luke will cover later. We'll also you know, notice that 
you know, it, it's really actually quite hard to time the market cycle, to pick the bottom, to pick the top. And I'd suggest that we should be building our portfolios, assuming that we can't time the market. And so as we know, over longer and longer investment periods, we're gonna see more of these bear markets. It's important to have building blocks that are gonna protect you in those bear markets and compound growth um, throughout the, over the cycle. And that's why we think quality is that excellent long-term building block. It's because of its behavior across the cycle. Luke, as the, the slide turns here, I'm just inviting you in to, to just introduce AQLT. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Um, so the Beta Shares Australian Quality ETF, uh, or AQLT, is finally here, live and trading. Uh, it's been a little while in the making. Um, our product development team has spent the last two years working with index providers to ensure that the index and methodology we selected for this fund was one, uh, true to label, and that it provides a true quality factor exposure and that its performance over time will reasonably behave in ways that we would expect a true quality exposure to perform. And two, that the fund is also representative of the broader Australian market, and therefore could be held as an investor's core allocation to Australian equities. So research and literature over the years has demonstrated that quality performance is not only persistent over time, but also pervasive across regions. Therefore, investors should still be able to reap the same benefits of investing in a basket of high quality Australian companies as they would in any other region around the world. However, there are a couple of nuances present in the Australian share market uh, that make it a little bit tricky in developing an index that provides a true quality factor exposure. Firstly, as we know, the Australian share market is dominated by cyclical industries such as financials and materials. I think today BHP and the big four banks uh, represent about a third of the Australian share market alone. Now, cyclical companies are not usually quality companies. As well, cyclical companies like the banks and miners tend to benefit most during times of economic expansion. Quality companies, as we've discussed, are less reliant on a growing economy and are companies that have strong business models and market positions that can sustain the more challenging stages of the market cycle. Given the dominance of cyclical industries, it could therefore be said that the Australian market is relatively lower quality, I guess, compared to other countries and regions. Now, the second nuance, which sort of relates to the first, is that the Australian market is extremely concentrated and top heavy, with the largest 10 companies comprising over 45% um, of the top 200, and the largest 20 names representing over 60%. For context, the top 20 names in the US, which of course are dominated by tech mega caps and fang stocks, only make up about 35% of the broader share market. So we're constructing an Australian quality index from a starting universe that is both highly cyclical and highly concentrated. The key danger is that you'll end up with a basket of mid and small cap stocks, which creates a significant size bias in your portfolio. And what you don't particularly want is this size bias becoming so dominant that it leads the portfolio to become more strongly correlated with a size or small cap factor rather than quality. As we saw a couple of slides back, investment factors tend to outperform at different stages of the market cycle. And quality and small cap certainly have different performance patterns over time. Additionally, in the absence of any significant large cap representation, a portfolio of small and mid caps will almost certainly track very differently to the broader Australian share market, which reduces the potential to use this fund as a core allocation to Australian equities. Therefore, in order, in order to obtain a true quality exposure and an index that is also representative of the broader Australian share market, our product development team acknowledged that it was vital for this size bias, uh, to control for this size bias within our index methodology. So I'll just step through uh, the index methodology uh, quickly now. Uh, so you'll notice a few similarities to the QLTY methodology. Um, however, there's quite a few key differences as well. So the starting universe comprises the largest 200 names in Australia by market cap. The universe is then split into two groups. Uh, group one consists of Australian large caps or the top 50% of free float market cap. And group two consists of mid and small caps, being the bottom 50% of free float market capitalization. A composite, a composite quality score uh, is then calculated for each stock based on a company's profitability, 
its debt to equity or leverage ratio, and its earning stability. And within each group, the company with the highest quality score receives double the weight of the company with the lowest quality score. Now the final portfolio bolts together groups one and two, and to ensure there is sufficient representation of large, mid and full cap, and to effectively neutralize the size, the size bias in the portfolio, the fund includes all stocks from group one and only the highest ranked quality stocks from group two, up to a total of 40 constituents. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's great. The breaking up of the, the investable universe into those large caps is one group and then the mid and small caps is another. Just, you know, excellent outcome for investors in terms of ensuring that they, they don't have any, any unwarranted um, outcomes from this portfolio. Um, I think we've jumped through a few of those points there, but I, I really like that. Yeah, exactly, Ken. I just wanted to include one more slide here uh, to demonstrate the importance of controlling for the size bias in Australia, specifically when targeting factor exposures like quality. So this blue line here represents the outperformance of Misky World quality versus Misky World over time. So when the blue line is trending upwards, it represents a period of time where quality as a factor is outperforming the broader market. Now you'd expect an Australian quality fund to show a similar excess returns profile over time. However, if we take a look at one particular off the shelf uh, Australian quality index that doesn't control for the inherent size bias, we can see that we get quite a different excess returns profile. Indeed, the size factor or small cap factor, if you like, is clearly dominating the quality factor over various periods and causing unusual performance patterns, uh, particularly from the start of 2015 there uh, through to the COVID crash in 2020. Now, if we overlay AQLT's index, which we know does attempt to control for or eliminate that size bias, we get a much similar looking excess returns profile. <clears throat> excuse me, compared to the blue line, implying that the index is indeed providing a true quality exposure and essentially behaving as we would expect it to over the market cycle. And I'd just like to quickly mention that it's not, this is not at all a dig at uh, S&P's quality index. There are a number of off the shelf Australian quality indices now available in the market today. Unfortunately, however, most of them were originally designed with other global share markets in mind and don't really cater for the nuances in the Australian share market uh, that we just discussed, which is why we ended up working with Selassiv to build a customised index. So taking a look at performance now, we can see AQLT's index has outperformed ASX 200 since inception. And we can also see that the index has noticeably kicked away um, and outperformed uh, during the 2018 and the COVID 2020 uh, down market. But overall, uh, performance has moved in a fairly similar pattern to the broader market. Tracking error has historically been about 4.5% since index inception, uh, which of course is important in considering AQLT as a core allocation to Australian equities. Now, these two charts provide some further analysis on how AQLT's index and QLTY's index uh, have performed relative to the broader market during market decline. So again, when the orange lines are trending upwards, it tells us that the quality index is outperforming the broader market. And those charts also contain drawdown series, which allows us to easily identify when share markets uh, were in a period of drawdown or trading below a previous peak. For example, if we look at the Australian chart on the left hand side, we can see around March 2020 uh, that the market was down about 30%. So these charts demonstrate that the two quality indices have generally outperformed when we have expected them to during those serious down markets. If we look at the back end of the GFC, uh, September 15, December 18 and COVID, all four of these market declines saw quality outperformance spike higher which I suppose provides additional reassurance that AQLT and QLTY uh, can, can both offer defensive characteristics in a down market. Yeah, I mean, thanks Luke. I think like this is sort of an important you know, chart for me. I mean, you know, there's the outperformance there, but, but forgetting that outperformance, um, it's about, you know, a, a product or a, or a fund that does what you know, it says it will do on the tin, right? Like this, this is performing as a quality exposure should do, and therefore 
we know how we can use it in portfolio construction, the attributes it will have and how it perform at different stages of the market cycle and how that works in com combination with other assets that we hold in our portfolio. So that's, that's why I very much am I'm very pleased with um, AQLT as, a, as an exposure. Exactly, Cam. So here's a fun snapshot. Um, so AQRT provides investors with an opportunity to passively invest in 40 of the highest quality stocks in Australia. And we're really excited to bring this fund to market, uh, being the first of its kind available to Australian investors. Uh, as you can see, management fees are 35 basis points, uh, which I believe is in line with the QLTY fund. Uh, sector allocation and top 10 exposures are there as well, um, but I believe we're going to have a couple of slides coming up that's going to take a bit of a deeper dive uh, into the, the sector profile and holdings relative to AFX200. So taking a quick look at the underlying fundamentals um, of the AQLT portfolio, uh, these are the three metrics uh, that were used in calculating the quality composite score in determining the security weights. And as we can see, the AQLT portfolio overall uh, is delivering a much higher, uh, in fact, almost twice as high return on equity and a much more stable profitability profile as measured by volatility of ROE, whilst taking on considerably less leverage compared to the market. And these are exactly uh, the underlying characteristics that we want to be seeing in a quality portfolio. So this slide provides a sector profile of AQLT's portfolio relative to the broader market. The biggest weight differential in the portfolio is the underweight to materials, which I think is about 8%, an 8% underweight at the last rebalance. And as this underweight is spread across most of the other sectors, you could probably argue uh, that there is more, more of a diversified rep representation of sectors compared to the ASX 200. Historically, the AQLT index has been overweight, uh, consumer discretionary, uh, consumer stables and tech companies, uh, while generally underweight materials and energy. So those last four I mentioned there are fairly consistent with what we, what we see in a quality exposure in other regions around the world. However, the historical overweight to consumer discretionary is perhaps a little bit unusual and maybe a little bit unique to the Australian market uh, that, and due to the fact that we have such high quality companies in this sector. Uh, with commanding market positions and stable businesses. I think West Farmers, ARB, Revel, just to name a few. And I think, Cam, you're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail later. Yeah, so, Cam, so we'll, we'll talk about... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you go. You, no, yeah, I'll, I think, yeah. Great. Yeah, so look, we, um, yeah, we'll talk about a few stocks, but um, I thought it was important just to touch on um, the, how, how that, you know, index construction in terms of, uh, breaking the, the market up into group one, the, the, the large cap stocks and group two works. And this is to look at the group one stocks, those large cap stocks, the largest 50% of the um, ASX 200 market capitalization by weight. There are 11 stocks in that. And um, AQLT -Y, AQLT's index includes all 11, but the weightings are different to the broad market. So you can see the stock names at the last rebalance, their quality score rank, in the second column, the weight within AQLT's index, and then the weight within the broad market index, as well as the differences in those weightings with the differences uh, greater than 1% either way, um, highlighted in, in green or red. Um, and so clearly there are some differences there. Um, one that, you know, so companies like West Farmers and, and Woolworths um, with higher weights, one that I think is quite interesting and we'll get to is the, the increased weight to, to Macquarie and the lower weight to the big four banks. Um, but we'll touch on that in a bit more detail in another slide. To talk about some of the individual names, well, West Farmers is one of those large cap names from Group 1. And, you know, look, West Farmers, in my opinion, at least, is a very well-run company. I, mean, I can't walk into a Bunnings without spending at least $100, spending two hours in there. Um, but, you know, on a serious note, like a few years ago, if we think about the way that West Farmers runs their business, they, they, they bought Coles as an opportunistic turnaround story. And um, they saw it was a struggling company, they executed to perfection. But more recently, when they saw that supermarket industries margins globally, and then in Australia, were starting to be squeezed, West Farmers you know, showed a lot of discipline and you know, disposed of that asset because it didn't meet their requirements as a high ROE business. So this is typical of West Farmers and 
of them running themselves as a quality company. Some of the lesser known names from group two, um, are some of those smaller high quality names from the Australian equity market that may be less familiar to you include Arb. Arb you know, is a leader in the auto aftermarket. So they specialize in uh, four wheel drive accessories. They're not known you know, well by the general public, but they're very highly regarded products. They've got very loyal customers uh, who obviously buy, buy these products and are interested in four wheel driving. And that's really allowed them to make very healthy profit margin, have very stable, impressive profit growth over a long period of time. And another one of these smaller quality companies is Coden. They're a specialist developer in metal detection and, and mining technology. They're based in Adelaide. Um, it, it sort of stands to reason that given our mining industry that we should have a leader in this field of, of mining technology. Um, and they've certainly got very, um, very impressive fundamentals. Um, and their, their customer list is also very impressive in terms of the world's largest mining operators, uh, governments, militaries and the like. So again, a very high quality company with very high margins on its business. So there are some examples of names, but I touched on this before. One that I find very interesting is uh, a comparison of, of the weightings to Macquarie and the big four banks. Now, you know, Macquarie, Macquarie very famously, subsequent to the GFC, pivoted its business model, focusing on what it called annuity businesses um, that are very capital light or capital efficient. And you know, I can tell you from personal experience that Macquarie is an organisation where every strategic business decision is, is made on the basis of return on equity or profitability. That's the key driver of business decisions. It will not invest in something which does not meet its hurdles. And, as a result, it's maintained a very high elevated level of return on equity over time. The big four banks, you know, obviously they're a little bit different in their business model. They would be considered a um, you know, sort of a whole, uh, whole financial service organization offering all financial services. And perhaps market share um, is, is a driver of decisions rather than necessarily just return on equity. The outcomes you can see there, um, and obviously the competitive landscape has driven lower return on equity for those businesses. So obviously we've got weightings within the financial sector as a whole, which roughly marries to the ASX 200, but within the financial sector, the weighting is two quality names like Macquarie and, and away from the lower quality names. Now, just wanted to talk a little bit about how Australians might think about investing in, um, in quality companies or in, indeed in QLTY and AQLT. Briefly, I show here a chart of QLTY's index versus the MISCI world over a you know, long period of time um, and also show that against the average active manager. So this is QLTY's index, but net of management fees um, prior inception and uh, even post inception, very strong outperformance versus active managers. You know, we know that typically active managers do in fact on the whole underperform broad markets but we find that net of fees QLTY has delivered very strong outcomes. And so a lot of investors who have used those high cost active managers who I referred to before are looking for a solution, which is gonna be lower cost that has often lower stock specific risk. And we've seen generally has produced stronger returns over the market cycle. They're looking for something like QLT um, to, to provide that solution. Um, the, the, uh, in terms of AQLT, this fund launched uh, just uh, about a month ago. So this uh, index, this is, if you like, historical or back-tested data, but we've removed the management fees and costs from that um, return series. So you can see that in comparison to the broad market index, as well of, as average Australian um, active managers shown there in blue. And, you know, for mine, a lot of, we see here a lot of investors we have some concerns with regard to the degree of concentration in cyclicals, um, in names like BHP and the big four banks, that they now have this solution, a potential solution that can allow them to tilt away from that part of the market without having to use an active manager. So we see that as a good solution there. Luke, I'll, I'll just invite you back in now to talk about, about other imp implementation ideas. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Well, well, one final approach, I guess, um, of incorporating quality funds in your portfolio can be to combine them with other passive factor funds, uh, particularly funds that target value. As we've discussed a number of times, uh, the, the factors quality and value often perform 
uh, strongly at different points in time and at different parts of the market cycle. In this chart, QLTY's outperformance versus MISCI World is displayed in orange. While MISCI World values outperformance against just the MISCI World benchmark is displayed in grey. And as we can see, there's almost an inverse relationship at times, suggesting quite a low correlation of return. Therefore, given this low correlation, if we believe that both these factors, quality and value, can generate excess returns over the long run, and historical evidence certainly suggests that they can, by combining quality and value funds together, we can get to the same return point in the future, but with lower volatility or over a smoother journey. So the table in the bottom right hand corner confirms that improved risk adjusted returns can be delivered if we blend these quality and value exposures together. And again, by higher risk adjusted returns, we mean higher performance or higher returns for a given level of portfolio volatility, which is measured by the Sharpe ratio. Yeah, thanks Luke. Just to really you know, reiterate that or explain the table. Um, so the first column is showing the QLTYs index. The second column is the MISCI World Value Index. So that's a value proxy. And the third is a, is a blend of 50% of each of those two um, exposures. And then the last column is that broad market exposure, MISCI World as a whole. Now, now the MISCI World Value Index has in fact underperformed the MISCI World, but because QLTYs perform more strongly, the blend outperforms the broad market. What's also interesting is that QLT, Wise Index and MISCI World of Value both have volatilities above 15%. So they're both higher volatility than the broad market, but because of the fact that they're, they're actually very lowly correlated, that drives down the volatility of the blend. That's adding diversification, which is why that, that volatility is in fact lower than the, the broad market exposure. So just an excellent you know, sort of example of showing how quality and value as opposing factors um, can work well in a diversified approach. Yeah, Cam, that's great. And, and again, we see similarly in the Australian market. Uh, this time we're looking at the outperformance of AQLT in orange uh, and the outperformance of QOZ, which obtains a strong value tilt in grey. And by combining AQLT and QOZ in a portfolio together, we can also see a much improved Sharpe ratio relative to ASX 200 which is driven by both improved performance and reduced volatility. Yeah, thanks Luke. And um, QOZ is in fact uh, our, the index, uh, QOZ the fund is in fact our beta shares uh, FTSE RAFI Australia 200 index, which is a, uh, a dynamic value tilt to holding the top uh, 200 Australian shares. So uh, appropriate in terms of a, a complementary exposure to, to quality. Great. So, look, I mean, just in, in summation, um, you know, our, our view is that if we look at the long term performance characteristics and, you know, the drawdown profile during market sell offs, we think that quality makes sense as a, a core portfolio allocation. Quality is also an investment style which very much lends itself to a rules based or index approach. And this means that you can access this sort of exposure at a lower price point, a lower cost and get better diversification often. And that's sort of key for building a core portfolio. Luke, did you want to touch on, on our funds there and just, just sort of cover off and on, also on India? Yeah, sure, Cam. So QLTY and AQLT, we, we, we talked about at length today. Um, QLTY being the, lo the lowest cost, I guess, quality solution uh, for global developed markets. And AQLT, the, the first of its kind. Um, India is a, is a fund of ours, double uh, IND, the Beta Shares India Quality ETF, which we didn't get much of a chance to talk about today, unfortunately. Um, but interestingly, India has very similar characteristics, or the Indian share market has very similar characteristics to the Australian share market, in that it's very uh, top heavy and, and highly concentrated, uh, just like Australia. So the India uh, index methodology is actually very similar uh, to AQLT. Uh, but all information, I guess more information on all three funds can be found on our on our fund pages, um, fact sheets and fund brochures. Great, thank you Luke. Um, important to note of course that yeah, this information presented was, was general in nature, um, please seek financial advice. Um, that, that concludes the, the formal part of the presentation, uh, but as, as I mentioned before, we, we wanted to take some of your questions 
Um, and so um, please stick around and we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can without without going um, to over the hour. But probably the first question that we have here that I'll, I'll just ask of, of you, Luke, um, is um, how should we incorporate quality into our Australian equity exposure from an asset allocation point of view? Okay, sure. So, okay, first of all, I guess we, we believe that AQRT um, provides sufficient diversification uh, and representation of the broader market to be considered as a core holding in an Australian equity portfolio. Uh, but alternatively, AQRT could be blended with existing low cost uh, passive equity vehicles. Uh, to improve the overall fundamentals of the portfolio, um, whilst also retaining a strong cost focus. And of course, given the Australian share market is, is heavily skewed towards, I guess, cyclicals, uh, adding an allocation of AQRT could also provide additional diversification um, to an Australian portfolio. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I think that's right, Luke. You know, you know, we we still think that there's a role for low cost broad market exposure, our A200 fund is the lowest cost broad market Australian equity fund, but you can blend that with AQLT um, to, to, if you like, reduce some of the cyclicality of your Australian equities. Um, and so the second question, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. How could a retail investor find a quality stock for investment? Um, so look, I mean, if you if you you want to go down that path and research stocks yourself, you, you know, I've, I've, we've obviously talked about um, the frameworks and the metrics that we use or that our index providers use to um, identify quality companies. And, and you know, you, you can um, do that and go through company financials yourself. Um, highlight some names here within the presentation. I, I will suggest though that our view is that the best way to approach an exposure like quality um, isn't necessarily to, to pick individual stocks, but to hold a diversified basket of these stocks. And you may find it, or I, I believe you would most likely to find it more cost effective to hold a low cost ETF rather than um, rather than trying to build that portfolio yourself. Um, but yeah, good question. Um, next question, which I will direct to you, Luke, um, as portfolio manager, what's the predicted income and, and franking um, of AQLT as a fund? What, what can investors expect from it in terms of uh, you know, income return? Yeah, sure. So look, looking at, well, I guess, 12 months historical, uh, trailing dividend yield, um, for the AQLT basket is about 3.75%. Franking is a little bit hard to determine as uh, that, that ranges from time to time. Um, but compared, com that's compared to 4.5% of the ASX 200. So a little bit under, under the market. Uh, yield obviously isn't a key objective of the AQLT fund. Um, but as we mentioned, the fund does hold a lot of the large caps and, and that way it should still be able to generate a reasonable yield um, over, over the years. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, still a very impressive yield overall. The Australian equity market does yield much higher than many other markets. Um, so still quite a, quite a reasonable yield due to the um, that portfolio construction approach used. Um, and um, and also, why only 40 stocks held in AQLT versus 150 for QLTY? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess in landing on how many how many stocks target uh, in the AQLT fund, it was a bit of a balance balancing act. Um, or a trade-off, if you like, uh, between providing sufficient diversification uh, and representation via sheer stock numbers without diluting the quality exposure. So as we've discussed, it was really important for us to deliver a fund that would perform how a quality exposure should. And if we were to keep adding more stocks in the portfolio, we'd start to dilute that quality exposure um, and say that expected performance start to waver. So we found that 40 stocks was our, was our line in the sand, uh, which provided pretty good diversification, uh, particularly across sectors, and also provided that true quality exposure. Um, next question, um, which I think we've sort of addressed throughout the, the presentation, but was, um, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, QLTY, you know, down substantially in this calendar year, what are the indicators signaling that quality funds will go up? Um, well, so I mean, I think uh, I sort of talked a little bit about that as to how different factors perform. Um, and it, you know, while we can't predict the future, if there was to be uh, you know tightening in monetary conditions, um, you know, you may well see that in that sort of environment, um, we see a rotation back to quality names. I mean, what I will say, and I tried to emphasise this, is that I don't think of quality as an investment style that you want to use to time markets. 
I think of it as an investment style that you want to leave in your portfolio throughout the market cycle and rely on it compounding um, outperformance over time. Um, and that, that's my view in terms of its use. Uh, and then, and then um, just briefly, uh, you know, question, Luke, if you're still there, um, anticipate, anticipated turnover for, for AQLT? Uh, yeah, so one-way turnover has ranged between about 18 and 31% uh, since index inception. Uh, so turnover and churn can obviously creep quite high in, in factor-focused funds. But I suppose keeping turnover to a minimum uh, was the key reasoning behind uh, electing to only rebalance this fund annually. So, so somewhere between yeah, 20 to 30% probably annually. Okay, great, Luke. So just to be clear on that, that what we're talking about there is that um, when the index rebalance occurs, that means that some stocks may um, exit the index or enter the index and how much turnover um, is realised um, in those rebalances. Um, so I say that 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 sort of you know that that sort of level of re of turnover is is in fact probably on average slightly lower than um, active quality managers. Um, so which is a good thing in terms of keeping your cost low. Um, and then just a you know a, another uh, maybe I'll make this the last question. But someone's asked about um, BetaShares AAA Australian Cash ETF. Should I use that instead until, until things settle down given the volatility in the market? Um, and look, you know, that, that is a great fund for a cash solution. Um, net of fees, it's yielding about 22 basis points, which is, I, I think, much you know, more than you'll find elsewhere. And it will increase in terms of its return as cash rates increase. Um, so that's a solution if, if you are that way minded. But, but what I will say is that a lot of investors, um, you know, get burnt when they deviate from their strategic asset allocation. When, when times are tough. So those people who sold out at the back end of the COVID crash and remained uninvested through that bounce. One reason I like quality is because it is somewhat defensive in its nature. So if I'm uncertain as, as to the future, I think it's still important to, to you know, maintain your allocation to equities. Quality is a, you know, a, a more defensive way of allocating to, to equities. And so you can use AQLTY to retain that allocation. And ideally, you'll see lower drawdowns if we enter into a recessionary environment, for example. Um, but yeah, you know, good, good question. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think we've we've answered a fair swathe of the questions. As I mentioned before, um, the team will hopefully reach out for any of those other questions that were unanswered. Um, Luke, really appreciate your your thoughts and insights um, and taking us through how that index was developed. Um, appreciate everyone on the line taking the time out of their busy days to, to listen today and for all your support of, of beta shares over the years. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. Thanks, Cam. Great. Thanks, Luke.